the Gospel of John, chapter 21. Uh, For context sake, we're going to read from verse 18, and we will read to the end of verse 25. The title of this message is, What About This Man? Let me read for us. (coughs) Jesus is speaking to Peter. He's just restored him. And now he says in verse 18, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who had leaned back against him during the supper and said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things. And we know that his testimony is true. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. And so, Lord, one last time, we thank you for your word and we plead with you. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see and understand what has been written. I thank you that this is the spirit-breathed word of God by which you show us Christ and our need for Christ and by which you lead us to Christ. I pray you'd give us strength now, Lord, to understand and your word would dwell in us richly and bear much fruit. God, I even pray for salvation today. If there is anyone in here who has yet to believe that Jesus is the Christ, yet to cast their eternity, their hope upon the blood of Jesus, I ask that you would show them the glory and beauty of Christ and their great need for Christ and that you would stir us all in worship to Jesus. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One of the chief glories of the church, of a Christian church, is its variety. And yet the, the unity it has around Jesus the world should look at this room and those in the overflow and, and, and not really be able to understand why this group of people would be together in the same room, singing songs and opening the same book in their laps. Like, it, it shouldn't make sense. There ought to be people from every ethnicity, from every culture, from every generation, with every different kind of interest, yet unified around Jesus. In fact, Jesus says that is one of the ways the world will know that this whole thing is true, that that this group of people is able to love one another. And so one of the chief glories of the church is its variety. Yet one of the dangers of the church is division. Gossip, a frustration with one another, a frustration that they don't think exactly the same way as I do about maybe some of the things going on politically or culturally or whatever it may be. One of the greatest dangers in the body of Christ is this, is this conflict with one another. Now, as we turn to these final verses in the Gospel of John, If you were here uh, two weeks ago, we saw that truly the proper ending to John was in John chapter 20, is that that, uh, verse 
30 and 31 tells us this was all written, all of these signs were written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and by believing you would have life in his name. It's this wonderful climactic end as Christ has risen from the dead and we hear this purpose that you believe in Jesus. And then there's chapter 21 and suddenly we have this kind of strange story about the disciples and they're fishing and then they're having breakfast on the beach and then finally there's this, this walk and this conversation with Peter and Jesus. It's, it's, it's anticlimactic in some ways and, and we, we saw what is the purpose of this final chapter and we remembered that this is the epilogue to a, a wonderful masterpiece. If you remember, John chapter 1 begins with the prologue. And you have all of the themes of this book in the prologue. At the end of the story, after the climax, as in many good books, there's an epilogue. And it's this kind of down-to-earth story where it ties up all these loose ends and we saw it, it actually kind of grounds the readers of the gospel of John to say essentially, what about you? Now that you have heard and seen all of these things that Jesus has done, what about your life? Will you follow Jesus? What does, look, what, what does a, a person who is following Jesus, what does that really look like in ordinary life with ordinary jobs and ordinary relationships? What does discipleship, what does it mean to follow Christ? And so we have this epilogue in John 21, and the, the final section of this epilogue does something profound. John, as he is writing this account for us, he parallels two disciples. He puts before us two very different disciples, and we see two very different lives as they each follow Christ. And um, if you actually look at the very last verse of the Bible, or of the, this Gospel of John, verse 25, we see in this final verse a key to understand kind of how to read this epilogue. Look with me at verse 25. Now there are many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Now people debate, is that hyperbole? Is it literal? It really could go either way. Jesus was the eternal Son of God, and if, if we were to write everything the eternal Son of God did and all that it meant, we would never get to the end of it. Or is this just a, a wonderful statement that John spent three and a half years watching Christ, watching miracles, hearing all of this, and he's just expressing it, it's too much to contain. Either way, there's, there's a key in this verse to understand this chapter and our text. And the reason why I'm drawing this out is I want us to kind of grow in our knowledge of how to read narrative in the Bible, how to be good Bible readers. And notice what he says. He did not write everything he could have written. He says, it's too much. And so what does that mean? It means that what he has written is important. It's significant. There's not a wasted word. There's not a wasted story. Everything that is written is significant. When a, when a person in the Bible is, is writing in the genre of narrative a story, often they, they kind of hide the significance of the story just beneath the surface. And so you, you, you'll begin to notice maybe a repeated word. Or sometimes the meaning is hidden in, in the dialogue, in what the, the characters are saying. The point is, John is being very selective about what he included, and it's significant. Now, if we look from about verse 15 down to maybe about verse 24, we see two disciples. We see a picture of the disciple Peter, and we also see a picture of the disciple whom Jesus loves, or, or as, as he says in verse 24, it's John, that, that beloved disciple. We see two disciples, and we will see in these few verses that there's a, a variety in how disciples of Jesus will actually suffer and die. We see there's a variety in, in how God has made them and gifted them, and we will also see there's a variety in, in their service 
in how they will fulfill the great commission like Bill prayed, how they will be disciples, it's going to look different. And so as we look at our text, we're going to see just three headings, three varieties in the body of Christ. We'll see varieties of suffering in verses 18 and 19. We'll see varieties of servants in verses 20 and 21. And then we will see varieties of service in verses 22 through 24. And, and what is the point of all this? The point is, what about you? What about your life? What about you and your discipleship to Christ? There will be a variety in how we fulfill the Great Commission and how we follow Jesus in our homes, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, in our extended families. There is great variety, and that ought to encourage us because very often we get so consumed by looking at one another or looking at the, 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 the pastor preaching or looking at the person doing this or the person doing that. And well, I'm not like that. And the point here is there is an intentional design for variety in the body of Christ that whoever you are, Christ has called you to follow him. And so the first thing we will see is varieties of suffering. Look with me again at verse 18 and 19. Jesus says to Peter, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show what kind of death he was going to glorify God. We see that here Jesus tells Peter, Peter, you will die for me. You will be a martyr. You will be among those believers who, because of their faithful discipleship, they will lose their life. You, Peter, will die because you are following me. And now look with me down at verse 22. Peter says, well, what about this guy? I mean, is he going to die too? Verse 22, Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Do you notice that kind of contrast there? Peter's going to die for Jesus. Does that mean every faithful Christian ought to die for Jesus? Well, we see even here, that the Apostle John will not die for Jesus. And we actually know from further scriptures, we, we can see in the uh, book of Revelation that all the other apostles had died, and yet John was exiled. He was alone on an island, the island of Patmos, while he received that revelation from Jesus. And we see here, intentionally drawn out, that the death of these two disciples will be very different. Peter will die, crucified, as church history attests. And John, as all we know, dies likely alone on this island, or maybe he came back. There's, we're not exactly sure what happened, but we know he lived a very long life. And here's one of the important things to note about this point, that there's varieties of suffering in the body of Christ. Look again at verse 22. Jesus said to him, if it is my, and then what's that word? Will. If it is my will. We ought to recognize that our lives play out according to the will of God. That our deaths play out according to the will of God. Our lives are not ultimately in our own hands. One of my favorite psalms in all the Bible, Psalm 139, one of the most astonishing verses, I'll read it for us, Psalm 139, verse 16, David says to God, your eyes saw my unformed substance, referring to David being formed in his mother's womb. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me. Every day of your life 
is written, so to speak, in a book that belongs to God. Every day of your life, including your last day, it is God's will that determines every second, every breath that we live, and even our death. And one more thing I want us to notice as we kind of take in this sobering reality that God is sovereign even over the death of the disciples, over the death of his saints. Look back up to verse 19. This he said to show what kind of death he was to what? Glorify God. Not only are our days numbered by God, our deaths are designed to do what? To glorify God. Some of us may give our life as a martyr and God will get glory as the world watches the blood of a Christian pour out on the ground. And we have seen throughout the scriptures and church history and even right now in many countries in the world that God orchestrates even martyrdom for his glory. That the world would see, why would these people suffer even to the point of death? Why would they do that? Well, because they are devoted to Jesus. And Jesus took his life. He he carried his cross and he died in faithfulness to God. And that is the call to every Christian. We must follow Christ, pick up our cross, and be willing to die. And some Christians actually will literally lose their life for Christ. And so we ought to prepare our hearts. Am I willing and ready to die for Jesus? Is it my desire that, I, that if it came to it, that God would be glorified in me as I even lay down my life for Christ? And yet we know it's not just martyrs' deaths who glorify God. We see that even John, in his prolonged death that was different than Peter's, he glorified God. We can see that as we may suffer physically, as we may be making regular visits to get chemotherapy, as we may go regular visits to check in to doctors and hospitals as we may spend, the majority of us will likely spend our last breaths in a hospital bed, even that kind of death has been ordained and orchestrated by God, and it is to glorify God. God is sovereign over the death of every person. Life and death comes from God. And are we prepared to come what may, it may not be martyrdom, it may be a chronic illness. Are we prepared in our hearts to face that death and to desire that God would be glorified in our death? One commentator said that Christians have the opportunity to be like Samson, who did more good for God in their death than they did in their life. Your final days may you may be more strategically positioned to glorify God than all the days of your life. Those are critical days. These are days that the world and other believers and other family members will see, is this faith for real? Is this a genuine faith? Does this person actually trust that his days are numbered by God? Does this person trust everything the scripture says about the character of God, even though their body is decaying? God is sovereign over the death of his saints. There, are, there is a variety of suffering in the body of Christ, but it is all for the glory of God. Now, I have one more question. For those of you who have yet to trust in Christ, I want to ask you, are you prepared to die? Are you prepared to see God? We will all see him. And those who are in Christ will be cleansed and covered by the blood of Christ and they will be accepted by God, not because of their good works, but because of the work of Jesus. For every other person who dies, you will be rightly held accountable for every word you spoke and every sin you have committed. 
Death is a thing, a, a, a reality that every one of us will face, no matter what we believe. And I just want to invite you to consider the fact that you will see God one day. And I want to plead with you to come to Christ, to go to the one place of safety, the one place where someone can say, I am ready to die. In fact, to die is gain. I would rather be with the Lord than in this body. That is the way Christians can face death, the way Peter could face death, the way John could face death, the way every faithful, true, genuine, born-again saint in this room can face death. And I want to invite you and encourage you to come to Christ where you need not fear death. And so we see first in this text there is variety of suffering. Next, we see there are varieties of servants of Jesus. There's varieties of servants. Look with me now at verses 20 and 21. <clears throat> Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man. Now, you may have noticed the past maybe seven or eight chapters, there has slowly developed this kind of parallel um, picture between, between Peter and John. It started in around chapter 13 as, as they began to be together in that upper room and they're eating the Passover and Jesus looks around and says, one of you will betray me. And picture how awkward that moment would be. And, and we know that John was, was next to Jesus, reclining kind of on one arm, and, and Peter was somewhere else. And Peter looks over at John and, and, and implies, hey, ask him. And so John leans back and he asks him. We, we see even there, John had this, as it said, he reclined on the, the bosom of Jesus. He had that close intimate relationship with Jesus. He's referred to even here and throughout the gospel as the disciple whom Jesus loved. There are some disciples, some believers that have that kind of relationship with Jesus. You may think of Mary and Martha, right? And Martha's out there getting it done and serving Jesus while Mary's just sitting at his feet. And Martha's frustrated with Mary. We see these varieties of servants in chapter 19, remember as Jesus was arrested and it says the disciples were scattered, we see that both John and Peter follow Jesus into that courtyard and yet Peter was afraid and he didn't go in the courtyard but John does go in the courtyard and then we see Peter eventually gets in there and, and he's not willing to be identified with Jesus and so in that courtyard he denies Jesus. In chapter 20, remember after the resurrection, who are the two disciples that run to Jesus, to run to his tomb, right? It's Peter and John, and we see that Peter, the man of action, he gets there first, and, um, but no, let me get this right. Who gets there first? John, oh, this is right, this is right. John, who we can, from all intents and purposes, discern he was likely younger, and we also know that from how long he lived. He gets there first, but what does he do when he gets there? He doesn't go in. He just stops and he's, and he's looking. Peter, the man of action, blows right past John, and he goes in and looks. But he doesn't really understand what's going on. But we see John is thinking and understanding. And then even the next chapter, as they're in the boat together, and this man calls out to them, hey, have you caught any fish? Why don't you throw your nets in? And it is John, the, the thinker, the one who's recognizing, wait, I've been here before. This is Jesus. And when Peter hears it, what does he do? He just jumps into the water, leaves all his guys with all the fish, and he goes to be with Jesus. We see this intentional kind of picture of these different men with different personalities, different um, dispositions, and we, we see that intentionally. Why is that here for us? Well, because we are so prone to compare ourselves with one another. We are so prone as disciples of Jesus to prize certain people over other people in the body of Christ. The book of 1 Corinthians addresses this issue in almost every single chapter. 
that was a young church like our church, and one of the, the chief problems in that church was their obsession with men. I'm of Peter. No, I'm of Paul. No, I'm of Apollos. No, I'm of Jesus. They made their identities other men, other disciples of Christ. We have the same proclivity to do that even as 21st century Christians. I'm of so-and-so. I'm of this tradition. I'm of that tradition. That is our primary uh, way we, we may identify ourselves. And so Paul systematically goes to address those divisions in that early church. He says, him who waters and plants, they are nothing. It is God who brings the growth. We are not to attach ourselves to various leaders in the body of Christ. And then finally, he gets all the way, and I want to read for us a portion of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You can turn there with me if you want, or I can just read it for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I want to read a few different portions. This is important for us as a young church. This is important for you as you have been gifted by God to serve him, to follow him, to be a disciple of Jesus. It's important that we grasp the intentional variety there is in the body of Christ. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 12, and we'll start at verse 4 to verse 7. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit. Why? For the common good. Now jump down with me to verse 12. For just as the body, and he uses the human body here as a, as a metaphor all the way to the end of the chapter. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. And he's speaking of our new birth there. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell but as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. There are varieties of servants in the body of Christ because God wanted it to be that way. He chose 12 apostles on purpose with different gifts, different proclivities, different abilities for his glory and the common good of the church. And then Paul would go on in verse, or chapter 13 to speak of, do you know what matters more than our various differences and our various gifts and our various responsibilities? That we would love one another. That we would love one another. And then even in verse, uh, chapter 15, this is an incredible verse. This is a verse that if you struggle with comparing yourself to someone else in the body, Memorize 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. It means you're not who you're not. You're not so-and-so, and you're not so-and-so, and you haven't been gifted this way and that way. Who decides who you are? God decides. It is God's grace that orchestrates the various gifting and responsibilities in the body of of Christ. By the grace of God, I am what I am. This is by God's design and for his glory and for the good of the church. And now finally, to flesh this out, because there's varieties of servants, there will also be varieties of service. 
It's going to look different. We, you, will serve Jesus and be a disciple of Jesus in a way that's different from the person sitting next to you on other, the other side and in front of you and back. We will all serve him uniquely. So flip with me again to our text, John 21, verses 22 through 24. Let's look at the varieties of service that John is placing before our eyes Verse 22, Jesus said to him, if it is my will, he remain until I come. What is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say he was not to die. But if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things, and this is the key, and who has written these things. And we know that his testimony is true. What John is highlighting here is he had a unique service to the body of Christ. He would live a long time. One of the purposes was so that he could compile and write down this gospel, his letters, and the book of Revelation. His ministry, his role of service was one of writing that would serve all the church for all the rest of church history. We are being served by the unique role of the Apostle John because he wrote this book down for us. Now, if you will recall, what, what happened right before this conversation? In verse 15, Jesus restores Peter. And what is Peter's ministry? Is his a ministry of writing? Peter did not write a gospel. We have a few uh, letters from him, and it's very likely the, the, the gospel of Mark had his apostolic kind of authority over it, but he didn't write anything down. What, what did he do? Well, he was the shepherd of the sheep. He was the leader in the early church. He was the one who would stand forth and lead the church and feed the church and shepherd the church. He was a leader. He was a public spokesman for the church. He was intentionally designed differently by God for his unique service. John was also designed by God for his service. In fact, people joke, we don't hear a lot of dialogue coming from the Apostle John in all the Gospels. It's because he, he was very likely a shy person and he wasn't this guy who would put himself forward and he was just biding his time until Peter died so he could finally begin to speak. I mean, it's a bit of a joke, but we, we see that as true. Peter dominates the Gospels and he dominates the first 10 chapters of the book of Acts. Yet we see this unique ministry that through all of Peter's ministry was behind the scenes, it was quiet, it wasn't public, no one really thought or knew a lot about this Apostle John, and, and that was okay with him. He doesn't even name his, his own personal name in this book. We have to piece clues together to understand who wrote it. The point is this, there are varieties of service in the body of Christ. And I want to read for you another verse that if, if you struggle with wondering what is my place in the body of Christ. I have these desires. I love Jesus. I want to serve him. But what's my place? What's my role? How, what, I don't even know exactly what my gifts are. Or, or it may even be how could I serve Christ when I'm stuck in this job or in this family or in this neighborhood or with these difficult circumstances? We will all go through seasons of life where, where it can be distressing to think, am I wasting my life? Will I ever serve Christ? What, what is God's purpose for me? This verse, and we read it in our scripture reading out of Psalm 138, verse 8, is powerful. And it, it, if you struggle with that, memorize this verse. Psalm 138, verse 8. Let's hear this promise from God together. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. It is not us in our own wisdom and strength and orchestration to find and figure out and achieve and accomplish our place. Else if we don't do that, our life will be wasted. That's not how it works. It is the Lord who fulfills 
His purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. I love this. Do not forsake the work of your hands. As Ephesians 2 says, and let me just read that for us. Ephesians chapter 2 is a New Testament equivalent of that verse. Ephesians 2.10, after Paul speaks of God's sovereign election in eternity past in chapter 1, and as he speaks of his ability to save people dead in their sins in chapter 2, all of this, what's it all for? Well, chapter uh, 2 verse 10 says this, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Why were we chosen? Why were we saved? Why were we born again to a living hope? We are the workmanship of God. We are trophies of the grace of God. And our lives and our ministries and our unique circumstances and gifts and opportunities are prepared beforehand by God. And what is our role? Well, we walk in them. We're sheep. We're not that smart. But he's the good shepherd and he will lead us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Which really leads us back to our text because all of this juxtaposition of Peter and John and there's varieties of ministry and personality and and suffering, what's it all for? How does it flesh out? Well, we see here in the final words of Jesus, uh, uh, the last command that he gives to Peter, and it's the last one that we ought to listen to for ourselves today. What is his response to Peter? As Peter's kind of wrestling with this issue in comparison, and what about him and me? And verse 21, let's look at that one last time. This is really what we ought to, what is this all for? This right here. When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will, he remain until I come. What is that to you? You follow me. What is the point of all this variety in the body of Christ? You, you follow me, Jesus says. These are the last recorded words in the gospel of John. Again, he says in verse 25, I could have given you infinite books, But I want you to hear these last three words of Christ. You follow me. He begins with you. You follow me. What about this man? What is that to you? I'm his Lord. I'll take care of him. You follow me. And we ought to ask the Lord to reveal if there is some ungodly preoccupation in our heart with other people any kind of ungodly comparison or ungodly focus on other people, on their sanctification, on their performance, it is so in the human heart to obsess over others. Social media is nothing new. We just have a greater ability to look at others all the time. That ability, that, that, that fleshly question is right here in Peter's heart. And we, we can see that because Jesus rebukes him. We can see from the response of Jesus, this wasn't some good-hearted Peter's thinking, man, I want to care well for for my brother John. You know, what's his future? We see in Jesus' response, what is that to you? We are prone to, to, and this is so profound. Look at verse 20. Peter's having a conversation with Jesus. He's walking with Jesus. This is going to be one of the last times he's ever with Jesus. In verse 20, what does Peter do? He turns and looks at another disciple. Isn't that how it works? I mean, imagine if you got to have a walk with Jesus, and as you're doing so, what's consuming your mind? Well, what about that person? Well, uh, let me look away from Christ and start asking questions about other people in the body of Christ. What a foolish thing for Peter to do. And so Jesus says, you follow me. You follow me. And then I love those words, not only you, but you follow me. And incredibly, John is a a great um, writer. The first time 
we kind of hear those words is in the beginning of this gospel, the beginning of John, John chapter one. Now, when we think, what does it mean to follow Jesus? The Bible tells us a lot about following Jesus, and we can see from other gospels the various ideas and aspects of following Jesus. But in John, there's something special. There's a, a context it's in. And so I want us to see the, the first words of Christ and the last words of Christ are essentially, follow me. And I want you to see that as we flesh out what is, it, what is he saying to Peter what is, what is the Spirit of God saying to you this morning as we read these words? Look at John chapter 1. The context is John the Baptist is baptizing people, and he says, behold the Lamb of God. And then the next day, look at verse 35. The next day, John the Baptist was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus and, as he walked by, and what does he say? Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they, what? Followed Jesus. Jesus turned, see there's lots of cool parallelism here, and saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and you will see. And now if you look down at verse 43, as more guys are starting to gather around Jesus, the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow Jesus me. We see the beginning of the gospel open up with Jesus calling these men to follow him. And what is the context? This is so perfect. This is so important, actually. Because who is this me? Follow who? Follow me? Well, in John chapter 1, the emphasis is behold the Lamb of God. What is discipleship in the context of the gospel of John? Well, we are to follow the lamb, the lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. This is important because growing up, I, I got saved around 21 years old, and I grew up in a Christian home, in Christian church, and went to Christian school, and I knew a lot about the Bible, and I heard a lot about Jesus, and I heard a lot about following Jesus, and a lot about discipleship. And all my life, I just wanted to follow Christ and obey Christ. And so what did I do? I just filled my life and my time with doing stuff for Jesus, obeying Jesus. Whatever he says, I wanted to do it. But do you know who I ne what I never understood? That I, was, that I was following a lamb who was slain for my sins. I honestly thought I was the lamb who had to keep slaying myself sacrificially so that maybe he would accept me, so that maybe I could do enough so that he would say, okay, well done, good and faithful servant. No, we follow the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What is the beginning of discipleship? That we recognize that Christ is the lamb of God, that he has done what no one could do by perfectly obeying every command in the Bible and offering himself as the perfect sacrifice for sinners, for religious people, for people who are trying to save themselves. We can never do enough. We can never obey enough, follow enough to make ourselves right with God. What is the beginning of discipleship? What is the essence of following Jesus? Well, we recognize that he is a lamb of God who was slain for my sins. That is the, the, the entryway into discipleship. The, the Sermon on the Mount, the very first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit. What is the first step of discipleship? Recognizing I cannot save myself. I cannot follow enough and obey enough and sacrifice enough to ever wash away my sin. It's this humbling recognition that I cannot save myself. I am not sufficient, but Christ is sufficient. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That is what discipleship looks like. In particular, that is the thrust and emphasis that John is drawing out as Jesus says, follow me. One pastor who I uh, really appreciate, James Montgomery Boyce, put, put it this way, Christianity is Christ. It's not some activity. 
It's not some mere obedience to Jesus. Christianity is Christ. It is what he has done and only he can do for sinners such as us. And I even love the way that this command to Peter to follow him comes after the conversation he has on the beach. And what does Jesus ask of Peter? Peter, do you love me? We don't follow Jesus to try and work up love for Jesus. Discipleship, following Christ must come after our hearts can genuinely express love for Christ. That's why Nicodemus in chapter 3, he's asking, what, what can I do? How do I enter the kingdom of God? And Jesus points out, you need to be born again. You need a new heart. You think by all this doing, you can follow me and enter my kingdom? You need the, the Spirit of God to work a miracle in your soul to give you new life. You need to have genuine love for Christ before you can ever faithfully follow Christ. And so he says to Peter, you follow me. And I want us to end this text in the Gospel of John very, very briefly thinking about the very last word Jesus speaks in the Gospel of John, you follow me, me. And as John ends his Gospel in verse 25, there are many other things that he did. I couldn't, I couldn't write it all down, but, but what, he, what, he, what he has given us is 21 chapters of Christ. And that is what he wants, I mean, put it this way, if he could write an infinite book and he gives you 21 chapters, those are pretty important 21 chapters. We ought to spend time looking at who is this Christ, at, at this great me. And so I'm gonna close by together, each of us thinking of who Christ is from each of these chapters. Follow me, who is me? Well, first, chapter one, he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You are a sinner. You will stand before God one day. But because of Christ, there is forgiveness of sins. Chapter two, we see he is the temple. It says, tear down this temple in three days, I will rebuild it. We were built to have fellowship and communion with God. Listen, you will never enjoy communion with God apart from Christ, the true temple, the one who has brought us to God. He is the word that has took on human flesh so that he could be the sacrifice, so that we could be uh, in communion with the living God. Chapter 3 of many things we could say, he's that lifted snake in the wilderness where the Israelites were sinning against God and he sent these poisonous snakes and people were literally dying. And yet God himself provides a way for them to be healed. He tells Moses, put this bronze snake on a pole and yell to people who are dying in their sins, look at this snake and you will live. And Christ says, as that snake was lifted, so I will be lifted on the cross that sinners in their sin and in their dying can turn and look to me and will have life. In chapter four, we see he's the great evangelist who pursues Samarit the Samaritan woman, goes out of his way to meet with this sinful woman living in sin, and he offers her living water. Chapter five, we see he is the one the Old Testament is all about. If you open this book and forget about Jesus, you are reading it so wrong. This book is about Christ. Look to Christ. Everything in the Old Testament is some way, shape, or form pointing us to Jesus. Chapter six, he says, I am the bread of life. Your soul is eternal. You will live forever. And you have this insatiable craving in your soul and only one person will satisfy it and it's Jesus Christ. Have you tasted and seen? Chapter seven, he stands up and he calls those who are thirsting in their souls to come to him for water of life. Chapter eight, he declares he is the light of the world. This is a dark world. 
There is darkness here. The God of this world has blinded the eyes of unbelievers, and yet Christ is the light of the world who has come to bring light to this world. In chapter 9, we see that fleshed out as he opens the eyes of the spiritually blind man. How do we see Christ? Do we do again enough work so that, so that our eyes can be seen? No, Christ heals this man by grace alone, demonstrating this is how I save people. Chapter 10, Christ is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Our world is craving for leadership and care, and we see that Jesus is that perfect leader, that perfect shepherd, the one who puts his sheep before himself. Chapter 11, we see he is the resurrection and the life as one of his own dear friends has died and Jesus weeps at his grave as he is comforting his friends, even as he knows he will raise this man from the dead. Each of us will spend far too much time around the graves of loved ones, and yet we remember that Christ is the resurrection and the life. Chapter 12, we see Christ as the humble king who rode in on a little donkey as the crowd wanted to make him a conquering political king, he rode in on a donkey and resisted their attempts to make him king. Chapter 13, we see he's the humble servant. He took the lowliest job and he washed the feet of his disciples. Chapter 14, we see he is the way, the truth, and the life. Not one of us will know or come to know God apart from Christ. Chapter 15, he is the true vine through whom all of our effectiveness in discipleship must flow. Apart from communion with Jesus, we can do nothing. Chapter 16, he's the giver of the Holy Spirit and he pours out his spirit so that though Christ has returned to the right hand of the Father, through the Spirit, we are still daily and constantly communing with him. Chapter 17, he is our high priest who even now is interceding for you, for your weaknesses, for your circumstances. Christ is still praying for you. Chapter 18, we see he's the obedient son who willingly took initiative to go to the cross. In chapter 19, we see the lamb of God lay down his life as the perfect sacrifice where he declared it is finished. No more for you to do, to earn any righteousness before God if you are in Christ. Chapter 20, he's alive. He's alive again. He's the risen Lord. And in chapter 21, he commissions his disciples to follow him. Do you know him? Do you love him? And will you follow him? Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for who you are. You are the one who is able to save. You are the one who has provided salvation through your own righteous life and your sacrificial death. Christ, you say in even chapter, John says of you in chapter one, you make known the Father the invisible God, Christ, you becoming human flesh, you help us even understand all the glory and attributes of God himself. For all eternity, we will be looking at you, Christ, and learning who you are and getting to know you more. And I thank you for that. But now, Jesus, you said to us, as you said to your disciples, I don't, I don't ask, Lord, that you take them out of the world. But as you sent me, now I'm sending them into the world. And Christ, we recognize we have been sent by you. We have the good news that we have been forgiven because of the blood of Christ and our trusting in you. We have the spirit of God in us. And like these disciples, we now bear the best news this world has ever heard that there is a Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, that there is a resurrection and a life to be found in Christ, that there is eternal life in Jesus, that there is hope in the darkness. 
Christ, who is like you. Truly, our words are inadequate, but we worship you all the same. I pray, Lord, that you would continue to call us to follow you, Jesus, to lay down our own efforts and attempts to save ourselves or to provide or care or lead or have enough wisdom to orchestrate our life, and we would follow you, the good shepherd. I thank you for these saints, Lord. I pray even now you would encourage them and pour strength and courage into our heart that we can leave here following you. And if there is someone here, Lord, who is yet to be born again, we ask that your spirit would blow like wind and would grant them new life and they would repent of their sins and trust in Christ. And so church, let's reflect on this truth and sing these words of this great hymn together of the love of God in Christ. And then after the song, we'll take communion together.